Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today, many people think of NASA as synonymous with space exploration, but it wasn't actually created until after the US had already launched a few satellites in the early days of the space race. The first US satellites were launched in 1958, but not by NASA because it didn't exist at the time. The first successful launch of a US satellite was Explorer 1. Uh, this was in February of 1958. The satellite was designed by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and launched on a Juno rocket by the Army Ballistic Missile Agency, with Werner von Braun leading the team. There were other satellites. Uh, the Vanguard was also launched by the US Naval Laboratory on the Vanguard rocket. So I was wondering, what was the first space mission actually launched by NASA? And to understand that, we have to understand how NASA was formed. So before NASA existed, there was NACA. That was the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics. It was primarily focused on aircraft research. And of course, NASA is still very much a pioneer in the field of aviation, even if most people only recognize its work uh, in space. Now, NACA internally established the Special Committee on Space Technology in January of 1958, but at that point, it was still very much a bystander observing other agencies performing the early US satellite launches. Now, if, as we come around to the summer, President Eisenhower signed into law the National Aeronautics and Space Act. That was established in NASA on July 29th, 1958. And the transition was set to take place in October of 1958. Before that date, a third US government agency attempted its first orbital launch. The Air Force Ballistic Missile Division had been using its Thor missiles for suborbital tests. In particular, they'd flown tests for re-entry vehicles for their more advanced Atlas rocket, and they'd also done some scientific experiments where they'd flown biological payloads with mice on board, and for that they actually used the more capable Thor Able. The Thor Able basically took the Thor as a first stage and it added a second and third stage from the Vanguard rocket. And on paper, this made it way more capable than the Juno or the Vanguard. So the Air Force worked to create a spacecraft with a more ambitious destination, something that could really exploit the power of Thor Able. Uh, and this was more ambitious than any program, American or Soviet. What they wanted to do with Able 1 was launch it on an orbit past the moon. Things worked initially, but 77 seconds into the flight, the engine failed and the vehicle was lost. Now, within a couple of days, the backup booster and spacecraft were getting prepared for an opportunity in the next month. Uh, but then the post-flight investigation suggested that there were problems with turbo pump bearings in the engine, and this had actually affected other rockets, not just Thor's, but actually the Atlas boosters, which shared similar engine designs. So instead of flying a quick second attempt, the engine was taken apart and rebuilt in an effort to remedy the problem. And by the time it was ready to launch in October, the program had become part of NASA. So NASA's creation took the entirety of NACA and it took elements of various other programs which had launched space experiments for the Army, Navy and Air Force. And that included the Thor Able moonshot that was being prepared for its second launch attempt. So somewhat by chance, the first launch that NASA was responsible for was an ambitious mission to fly around the moon while everyone else was still messing around in low Earth orbit. The Thor missile made for a great booster. It was certainly better than the Juno or the Vanguard. The only other thing that was in the pipeline was uh, Atlas, and that was too complicated at that time. So the booster, the Thor booster was fueled by kerosene and liquid oxygen, which fed an LR-79 engine. I think it generated about 80 tonnes of thrust. For Thor Abel, the second stage was uh, fueled by a potent mixture of nitric acid and UDMH or hydrazine, and that uh, fed an AJ-10 engine. And for the final kick towards the moon, the third stage was an Altair solid rocket motor. Now, since the first stage engine was built by Rocketdyne and the second stage engine was built by Aerojet, this is one of the first examples I can hear, think of that has 
Aerojet Rocket Dyne working together like they do these days. Um, so yeah, the spacecraft itself, it also incorporated a small rocket motor intended to break the spacecraft into orbit around the moon when it got there. And it also included eight little small single-use vernier rockets, which could be used to adjust the, finer tune the trajectory after launch. So the probe was built by Space Technology Laboratories, which would later become TRW. It had a final mass of about 23 kilograms, and 17 of those were the scientific instruments. These included instruments to measure radiation, magnetic fields, micrometeorites, temperature, but most ambitiously, this satellite featured a scanning image system that could photograph the moon, and they hoped to use this to reveal the far side of the moon for the first time. The launch took place from Cape Canaveral on October 11th, and all the rocket engines performed flawlessly. Unfortunately, the guidance did not. The first stage went a bit too high, and the error resulted in the second stage cutting its engines early. And after the third solid stage fired, the burn, uh, you know, the spacecraft was going a little too slow, about 150 meters per second. And that meant that it wasn't going to be able to reach the moon. They immediately fired the eight little small Vernier motors to give it a little bit of a boost, but ultimately the orbit would reach an apogee of about 115,000 kilometers, or about 71,000 miles. While it had fallen short of its lunar goal, this was still an altitude record for a satellite uh, at the time. However, the orbit's perigee was still inside the Earth, and in just under two days, the space probe would re-enter and be destroyed. But the spacecraft still had the rocket motor designed for lunar orbit insertion, and a plan was hatched to fire this close to Apogee and hopefully raise the orbit enough to keep it in space. So after about 20 hours, they sent the command up to fire the engine, but nothing happened on the spacecraft. Uh, it would later be determined that the motor ignition batteries had become too cold in deep space and were unable to deliver the amount of current needed to start the motor. The spacecraft was doomed, but it still had a couple of days to do science. Also, while the spacecraft was still in space, it got a new name. There was a press release issued by the Department of Defense and they described the probe as a pioneer and it would eventually be referred to as Pioneer 1, the first in a series of probes that would eventually leave the solar system. By extension, the previous failed Air Force satellite would get the moniker of Pioneer 0. So yeah, 43 hours after launch, the spacecraft entered the atmosphere and was quickly destroyed. But during the flight, that instrumentation returned good data they showed that the Van Allen belts attenuated as they headed to higher altitudes. They made the first observation of interplanetary magnetic fields and radiation and micrometeors and how the Earth's magnetic field interacted with the solar environment, including oscillations and wobbling that they measured. Now, they would again try to repeat this with Pioneer 2 using the same launch vehicle design and the same satellite, and this time the guidance system performed pr correctly for the first two stages, but the third stage failed to light and the probe fell back to Earth within the hour. And even then they still returned some useful scientific data showing that the Van Allen belts were more intense at the Earth's equator. After this, the Pioneer probes were switched over to being built by JPL and they moved them onto the Juno 2 launch vehicle. Pioneer 4 would be the first NASA spacecraft to approach the moon, and it's actually still out there today in a heliocentric orbit, out on its own. Uh, by the time Pioneer 4 had flown past the moon, of course, the Soviet Union had sent up their Luna 1 past the moon. In fact, it, it isn't well known, but within hours of the Pioneer 1 launch, the Soviet program, they had actually made their own attempt to launch a rocket with the, the Luna payload. And it failed, but hypothetically, if both Pioneer 1 and Luna had been launched successfully in some sort of space race, Luna would have reached the moon first because the R7-derived lunar rocket was much more powerful and had put the spacecraft onto a faster orbit. 
Anyway, since the largely forgotten Pioneer 1 launch, NASA of course has improved its success record. Although these days, it's generally more focused on the payloads than on the launch vehicles. And that Thor rocket, that eventually became a highly successful launch vehicle. It uh, evolved into the Delta series of rockets, but of course how that happened is another very long story. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.